subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello students, welcome once again to Senior High School Hour on Joy Learning Channel. This is your facilitator, Kojo Usuapia, coming to you once again. It's time for GK, and as usual, pick your parts, pens, and ready. get ready for today's very interesting lesson. So what are we looking at today? We are looking at ancient art. Ancient art. Um, there will be a series of things that we'll be discussing about ancient art, because there's a lot to discuss in this area. But today we are just looking at the first area, which is basically Egyptian art. We will, of course, be looking at other areas when it comes to ancient art. But today we are just looking at Egyptian art. So, are you ready? Uh, what comes into your mind when you talk about Egypt? Uh, what? Pyramids? Uh, the Nile? Hey, they are football team. Fantastic. So, we want to know more about their art today. So what are the objectives of this lesson? By the end of this lesson, you, my students, will be able to discuss the concept and major characteristics of Egyptian art. Again, you should be able to explain the concept of Egyptian art and its influence and relevance on other countries' cultures or cultures of the world. So what is ancient art? So ancient art refers to the many types of art forms produced by the advanced cultures of ancient societies. So when we are talking about ancient societies, we are talking about China, India, Mesopotamia, Persia, Palestine, and of course Egypt, Greece, Rome, and these are just a few to mention. So let's look into Egyptian art. By Egyptian art, I mean ancient Egyptian art. It is also referred to as art for eternity. By the end of this lesson, you should be, be able to explain why we refer to ancient Egyptian art as art for eternity. Now, ancient Egyptian art refers to the arts, painting, sculpture, graphics, poetry, and architecture. Now, these were done by the residents of ancient Egypt and this spans between the period, as you can see, from 6,000 before the birth of Christ to around 300 BC, that's 300 years before the birth of Christ. Now let's look at the concept, philosophy of Egyptian art. Let's first look at the illustration on our screens, right here. I think you are very familiar with this. Um, I intentionally did not label it, because I think you have a fair idea of what it is. Yes. So that's a mummy. That's a mummy. It's a typical way that Egyptians buried their dead. So a lot of discussions that we are going to talk about will be around or centered around this. So Egyptians produce artworks to revere or honor the dead or ancestors. In fact, that was their main theme of their artworks. Death was believed to be the transition from the land of the living, that's the physical world, to the land of the dead, the spiritual world. So the soul, which they call Ka, lives in the spiritual world, but in the same body that was living in this physical life. So let's look at an, another image on our screens. So that's a tomb, and in the tomb, you can see a sort of coffin, and then around that tomb, you can see a lot of artistic works on the walls. Look at it very carefully. It will be relevant in our subsequent discussions in this lesson. So the deceased had to be physically preserved along with earthly possessions and other reminders of daily societies. The body was mummified to prevent it from decaying now, artworks were meant to accompany the deceased into eternity. That is to say, the ancient Egyptian believed that if you were dead, then that was not the end of you. You live what we call an afterlife. So once you died, your body had to be preserved as exactly as it was when you were living. 
And that was the essence of mummifications. Now, what are the types of Egyptian arts? So, in this lesson, we are going to discuss these areas. We are going to look at Egyptian painting, sculpture, architecture, graphics, textiles, and of course, poetry. So, we're going to take them one by one and then go a little details into them. I know there will be further reading after these lessons, but I'm going to give you the very basic ideas that you need to be able to pass your exams. So let's start from Egyptian painting. Now, I'm going to categorize these areas into, in painting into various areas so that you'll be able to understand how very important Egyptians looked at their art. So I'm going to start with the tools and materials that they needed for their art. So in painting, colors were obtained from grinding orchids into powder and mixing them with gum. Now brushes were made from the cut stems of marsh plants. If you can remember, Egypt is just along the Nile River and they got these marsh plants along the river Nile. Now bristles were made by chewing one end of the stem to separate the fibers. Does that look different from prehistoric man? Basically the same, right? So that's how they got their brushes. Now painting were made on papyrus paper, wooden panels, stone tablets, and on walls and surfaces of pyramids and temples. There's an image of a painting on papyrus paper. So you can take a look at it. In fact, the Egyptians were very good painters. In fact, they are the mothers of modern civilization because they had a lot of ideas that they brought into this world. Now, what are the subjects and themes of Egyptian painting? So, mainly, it was people worshipping their deities, paintings of scenes of musicians and dancers, paintings about judgment in the underworld and familiar scenes around the world, as well as scenes from the earthly existence of the deceased. So these were the main themes for Egyptian painting. Again, paintings depicted the belief in life after death and the wealthy life of the elite class in the society. Now, scenes also showed people hunting and feasting. Again, the pharaohs and the wealthy and other very important people who were joining in the land of the death were subjects of the themes for Egyptian art and painting for that matter. So let's look at Egyptian painting in terms of technique, styles, and then characteristics. So I want you to look carefully at the image right in front of you. And um, as we can see, most of the images were in profile. When we say an image is in profile, that means it's a side view. So look carefully at the images right in front of you and try to identify the profile nature of such images. So, the head and legs are in profile with the torso and eyes in frontal view. So you can see the full belly, but you cannot see the full side of, let's say, the eye. Again, the legs are in profile. The other leg is also in profile. But it looks very disturbing. How could you see someone's belly, full belly, but cannot see the other sides fully. Yes, that's just the nature of Egyptian art. These are some of the characteristics. Now, there was also always a visual representation of class distinction in Egyptian art. So, men were painted bigger and darker than women and children. Prominent people and noble men in their communities were painted bigger and darker than slaves. So look in the image once again. Do you realize the male figure in this image there, right here, is bigger than any other image over there? So you see there's one there in the middle and then another one here. So males were painted bigger than females or women and children. Again, if you're a noble person in a society, like we said, you are going to be painted bigger than the others. Now, distance or depth 
in drawing that perspective was depicted by the placement of one body over the top of another. So this is one figure and then there's another figure and then another one right here in the middle. So this particular figure in the image is further behind the middle figure that you see. And that's how they represented their perspective. Again, animals and plants in their natural habitats were painted in a realistic form. Now, mural paintings and fresco, fresco means painting on a dry plaster surface, was dominant. Most of the paintings done by Egyptians were more or less fresco. Now, what are the functions of these paintings? What was the purpose? Why did Egyptians make their paintings? Now, the paintings were mainly to serve the dead in the land of the dead. So painting was not just for fun. It was for that purpose. Again, it provided the car, do you remember? The soul with familiar scenes from the earthly existence of the dead. So the paintings would depict when the, when the dead was living, they depict some of the scenes and some of his conquest on the various walls of the tomb, just to remind him that yes, he lived a good life and he should also live another good life after death. They showed the royal power of pharaohs or pharaohs. So if we had a very powerful pharaoh, paintings around his tombs depicted how strong he was, his wealth, his number of servants, and so many things that he had done in this life. Now paintings also show the superiority, richness, and prosperity of Egypt. Okay, so this takes us to Egyptian sculpture. Now, tools and materials used for Egyptian sculpture included, mostly, the sculptural figures were made from wood, granite, and other valuable stones like turquoise, jasper, and also quasite. So these were very strong stones that could last as long as possible. Now, again, White linen clothing were pasted on carved wooden statues of missing cops. So if you are a prominent person and then you died and we couldn't find your body, then you would carve an image, a life-size life image of you, and then paste linen around you just to represent you. And it was just respected as if it was the actual corpse of the living person who had died. So sharp carving tools such as gorges, chisels, were used for this carving. In, when they were modeling, they used very simple modeling tools, basically sticks for such modeling. Now, what were the subjects and themes for Egyptian sculpture? Now, most sculptural figures served funerary purposes, just for funerals. They were there to represent the dead and to serve the dead in the spirit of the world. Some had religious themes, and were representations of deities of gods and temples. Techniques, style, and characteristics of Egyptian sculpture. The Egyptian artists followed strict laws and conventions that directed their artworks. In fact, they were so strict that they were special people employed to perform or do these sculpture works. There was no way anyone, ordinary person, could just be asked or commissioned to make a sculpture piece because there were laws and conventions and if you didn't follow them, you were going to be punished for it. So they did not strive to change or it was not just original. Anything that had to do was something that had been repeated over and over again. So there was no form of originality. Now this explains why Egyptian art has tactic and no conscious of improvement. So if you take a very careful look at Egyptian art when it comes to sculpture, you realize that most of the sculpture works are looking just the same, with no innovations at all. Now, again, most of the sculptures were life-size figures. When we say life-size, that means just like the dimensions of a living human being. Now, sculpture figures were either represented in high relief, low relief, in bust figures, and sculpture in the round. So if you look at the image right on your screen, 
That's a typical example of a sculptural piece in the round. Again, with the technique style and characteristics, they were sculpted seated or standing or kneeling. So any sculptured piece that you see would either be standing or to be seated or kneeling. I have a sample of two that you can see. The first figure is standing. There are two figures actually, and the second figure is sitting. Now standing figures had their left foot placed in a forward position, as you can see in the image. So that's the left leg of the male, Faro, and then the female, you can see their left legs are in front. But let's look at the seated figure. The seated figures had their hands placed on their laps, as you can see. This was a law and convention of Egyptian culture, and it was never supposed to be changed. Now, let's look at the main figures that you can think of when it comes to sculpture. Um, if you remember the Sphinx, the Sphinx, Sphinx are very large pyramids, or guards for uh, pyramids. If you look at the tombs, there you have a pyramid right there, and that is the Sphinx right here. So that was another very huge sculptural figure made by the Egyptians. Now these Sphinx were more or less guards for the tombs or the pyramids. It was believed by the Egyptians that once these figures were placed by the pyramids, then it ward off evil spirits and any other person trying to come and steal things from the pyramids or the tombs of the pharaohs. Now, sculptural figures were painted in lifelike colors. As you can see on your image, this particular one, there's a relief sculpture of Tutankhamun, who is, who is just believed to be one of the youngest pharaohs of Egypt, and their wife, and you can see the way it has been painted. You can see the Egyptians were very skilled when it comes to painting. They tried to paint it in life colors. So you can see the nature, the, the brownish nature of the skin, as well as the accessories that they are wearing. It looks very, very natural. Again, the statues of men, as well as women, wore wigs. So they are wearing wigs, as you can see, on their heads. The relief sculptures were painted in bright colors. Again, as you can see, with the sample given you on your screens, very bright colors used for the paintings. Now the faces were usually more or less youthful. And the basic reason was that they wanted, you to, they wanted to preserve you as much as possible so that if you were made in a sculptural piece looking youthful, you always look youthful. Now what were the functions and uses of Egyptian culture, sculpture? So colossal statues, when we say colossal statues, we are talking about very big statues, bigger than life size. Now these were used as protective guards for deceased kings and other prominent persons buried in tombs or pyramids. So what comes into your mind for this first statement? We mentioned it earlier. Do you remember? Yes, Sphinx. So the Sphinx were colossal statues and they were there to protect the tombs, like we said. So life-size statues were used to replace missing dead bodies. Colossal statues of deities were carved and kept in temples of worship for religious purposes. Again, other sculptural works were also used for decorative and aesthetic purposes, for, that's for beautification. They boosted the general appearance of architectural structures, halls, and temples that were made by the Egyptians. Now let's look at Egyptian architecture. The main tools were bricks, granite, and limestone, that's to say the materials. And the main tools used were copper, to, copper tools, liver, uh, ropes for the cutting of canals in the rocks. Do you remember levers? I think that's in your science class, right? So 
It's not a, a human liver, but you can see from the spelling, it's a form of simple tool that was used by the Egyptians. Now, the main architectural structure that we can talk about when it comes to Egyptian art were the pyramids. So I'm sure you are familiar with the pyramids now. And the one in your picture is Pyramid of Giza, found in Egypt. Now, what were the techniques, styles, and characteristics of Egyptian architecture? So the pyramids were constructed on a square plan base. They were shaped as equilateral triangles and which tapered from the desert sands towards the sky. So, as you can see in the previous slide, there it goes. So it tapers right from the base to the sky. Now, each pyramid was dressed with limestone. Again, the tips of the pyramids were covered with thin layers of gold. And the entrance of the pyramids was always facing the north side. The pyramids had columns, halls, and also burial chambers. Now, each pyramid was encircled and enclosed by a wall. Now, earlier pyramids were step-sided pyramids, while those that came later were smooth-sided pyramids. When we say step-sided pyramids, you could climb the pyramids by the side because they were the stones were arranged such that you could step on them and then go higher the pyramid. But later, they were made smooth, so you couldn't just climb. Now, the sloping sides of the pyramids symbolize the rising of the soul, that's the car, of the deceased to the sun god for assistance on his endless cycle of regeneration. Again, the surfaces of the pyramids were either plastered or covered with relief carvings, paintings, and even hieroglyphics. So look carefully at the image right in front of you. That's a typical tomb or a chamber in the tomb. And you can see a lot of paintings on the walls. So even though they were architectural pieces, there were these paintings made on the walls. And sometimes even writings, Egyptian writings referred to as hieroglyphics, which we'll be meeting very soon. And these were the main things found on the walls of the tombs. Now, the architectural structures in the cities were very close together, so that gardens were sometimes made at the flat roofs. Now, the Egyptian surve surveyors were very knowledgeable in mathematics, geology, and geometry. So if you talk about these three areas, the pioneers were these Africans, ancient Egyptians. Now, what were the functions of these architectural pieces by Egyptians? Now, the pyramids were there to serve the everlasting dwelling place of the deceased soul called Ka. Now, it housed all the belongings that the deceased will be using in the land of the dead. As we said from the beginning, yes, they believe that when you die, your soul, that's the Ka, is going to live on. So whatever your earthly possessions that you need in the afterworld, were supposed to be buried with you in your tomb. Now, they built temples which served as places of worship for numerous gods that they had. And then and this typical example is the one you have in your picture. That's the Kanak Temple and the Shrine of Amun-Ra. Now, this was a very, very popular shrine. And up to today, people go there to visit the shrine right there in Egypt. So that's how the shrine looks like. That's an image right there on your screen. So it was just a temple, very beautiful temple. And inside the temple, that's a shrine for one of their gods called Amon-Ra. Again, Egyptians built funerary temples where rituals or special uh, funeral services were held for specific kings and prominent persons who had lived. So. This particular temple that you see is a mortuary for just one king. So this was a more or less a monument even found up to today. And it's right there and represents a very special burial place for a very known, uh, very popular or prominent person in Egypt, one of the pharaohs.
Now let's move to Egyptian graphics. Yes, the Egyptians were very good graphics, or they did very good graphics as well. There were a lot of graphic designers back in the days of Egypt's era. Now, the Egyptians used the papyrus sheets, linen, and surfaces of the tombs and stones as their main materials for graphics. Now, color, pigment were obtained from carbon, which was mainly black, and then the ground ochre in various colors like red, yellow, and brown. And then, as usual, like we said earlier, this was mixed with gum, which was used as a binder. Now, the brushes and pens were used as inscription tools in graphics. Now, what were the themes of the graphics for these Egyptians? Mainly, it was just writings and basically things that had to do with funerals and religion. So the text that they usually wrote had to do with something about funerals or about a religious stuff that they wanted to. So if you could remember, in the various tombs, I mentioned that you could have hieroglyphics right there on the walls, and these were some of the basic graphics that made by the Egyptians. So I have a sample of um, the main three graphic systems of the Egyptians. So we have hieroglyph, uh, glyphs, then we have a uh, hieratic and then demotic. So let's look at these three. Now the images represent just a portion of these writings. So the first one, the hieroglyphs, uh, mainly pictorial, then after a while, because the hieroglyphs were more or less sacred, they were not used often because it was meant for a special purpose. And then they invented another form of lettering that had to do with more or less being able to read a little faster. So they introduced what you call the heretic way of writing. Later, they introduced the third one, the demotic. So these were the main three styles of script writing invented by the Egyptians. Now, hieroglyphics followed a strict convention, making it a slow writing task, like I said. So, hieratic and Coptic were faster, which were another type of lettering invented by the Egyptians. And then, because they were faster to use, then they were used for everyday writing. Now, hieroglyphics was used for religious purposes, and this was referred to as sacred words by the Greeks. We'll learn later that the Greeks conquered the Egyptians, and then when they came, they were so surprised at the way that Egyptians had this form of writing systems. Hieroglyphics contained spellings or spells designed to preserve the dead name and appeal for his well-being in the afterlife. If you take time to observe the various hieroglyphics very well, you realize they are in pictorial forms, and each picture or pictorial form that you see represented an idea. Now, hieratic were used for administrative and business purposes, such as for business agreements, laws, code of ethics, or code of conduct of the land. Obviously, hieroglyphics couldn't have been used for these administrative and business purposes. Your guess is good as, it's as good as mine. We mentioned earlier that hieroglyphics were more sacred words and were used basically for spiritual purposes. Now let's look at Egyptian textiles. Now textiles began around 3400 BC, that's 3400 years before the birth of Christ, and it was very common among the Egyptians. Now they used flax harvested on the banks of the Nile to create their linen. So in your image there, there is a harvesting of flax by two Egyptians. And then they, they cut this flax and this is what they bring home to make their linen. Now harvested flax was made into threads and then fibers were woven on the loom. Now linen was the fabric woven from the flax. So there's a picture of an age, ancient Egyptian trying to leave, uh, weave something on a loom. And this is a representation of how it was done right there. Now, white silk was the major material for textiles. 
It is known that Egyptians didn't basically make silk, but most of the silk back then was imported from China. Yes, you heard me right. Egyptians got their silk from China and they used it for many purposes alongside the linen that they produced locally. Now, what were the subjects and themes of Egyptian textiles? Now, the earliest ones that we can see was basically for everyday life and also for a classy people in the society or the elite in the society. So the themes were basically that of funerals. And then again, linen, for example, was used for the dead. Then the strips of cloth were used to mummify the bodies of wealthy Egyptians who had died. The linen was used for, to elaborate royal costumes, to loin cloths for the laborers. So laborers also made use of some of these linen. Again, they also used these textiles that were woven for the sails of their ships. Again, with the techniques, they were the hand sewn or stitched or did weaving on their looms. So if you heard of crocheting and knitting and other decorative forms, yes, all these things were practiced by the Egyptians. In fact, they are the pioneers of these things, like I said earlier. Before the coming of this era, most of the things that we did earlier were already done by the Egyptians, long time ago. In your image there, there are some Egyptian textile workers working in the loom. Now, what were the function of these textile materials? Now, the fine linen fabrics were sewn into clothes and worn on the body as protection against the harsh climate conditions of the Egyptian climate. Again, the white linen clothes were largely used for mummification of the dead. So, as you can see, there's a mummy line there wrapped in linen. Egyptian pottery. The main tools used were porcelain or cowling, and this was more or less used for the main production of their wares. Now, most of the wares were also glazed and sometimes colored and fired at very high temperatures. Now, pointing incising tools were used for creating linear designs and scribbling, such as that of hieroglyphics on the surfaces of the wares. Most of the themes around Egyptian poetry were funerary themes, religious themes, and domestic themes. Now, let's look at this image there. That's the canopic jazz, a very popular Egyptian poetry. Now, poetry wares were glazed and fired at extremely high temperatures, like we mentioned. Now, notable amongst them is the canopic jazz. Now, these jars were there to preserve vital parts of the human body. So if you died and before you were mummified, your body parts were taken off or removed from the body and put in these four jars. So your heart, your lungs, your kidney, and the liver had to go into this canopic jars. Four of them, right? So the jars had lids shaped symbolically of a head of a man right here, a baboon, then a jackal, and then a falcon. Now these represented protective deities. So these four deities that you see were going to protect your heart, your lungs, kidney, and liver. Even though you were mummified, these jars were there to keep them so that they could maintain and make sure that they are still living, I would put that in quote, and then you could live the afterlife once these jars were keeping them. It's very interesting, right? And spiritual. Now the surfaces were decorated with symbolic patterns and funerary text in hieroglyphics, as you can see in the canopic jars right in front of you. Now what were the functions of these poetry? Basically, some of the vessels and jars were used for religious purposes. Now, the pottery wares were used for domestic purposes, such as storing oils, uh, grains, going to fetch water, 
and so many others. So these were the main functions of Egyptian poetry. Now this takes us to the relevance and importance or the influence art had on other cultures. Yes, we've talked so much about Egyptian art. We've talked about architectural works, their paintings, their textiles, their poetry, and so on. But did these things that the Egyptians do reflect on other cultures? Yes, it did. Even up to now, we still believe that Egyptians did the best art. So let's identify some of these areas that had influence by Egyptians. So it is undeniable that yes, Egyptians were mostly the best artists and most of the artistical her heritage that we have these days from various groups and societies around the world were based on Egyptian art. So Egyptian art assist, assists learners to appreciate the vital role art plays in social, economic, domestic, and religious life of a people. So Egyptians believe that their art were their ultimate. And even up to today, we still believe in these things that they did. And it still has an influence on the way that we do our art in modern times. Now, it provides important information to learners about tools, materials, and production techniques of the Egyptian artists so that we can what, de develop it and then implement other ways in which to do the art better. So if we look at Egyptian art, we look at it in a certain way, then we look at better ways in which to improve it. That's one relevance of Egyptian art in our culture today. Now, it alerts us of the themes of our artistic productions, which should reflect our cultural beliefs, norms, and values in the society. So as we looked earlier, most of the artistic nature of the Egyptian forms were original to the Egyptians. And it is a way of telling us that we should basically look at the way that we do our art and reflect upon it. We, don't, we shouldn't be quick to look at other cultural works of other people, but you should look at your culture and norms, beliefs and values, and work around it when it comes to your art. Now, art was and is still the foundation of civilization of Egypt and the world at large, and an eye-opener to the development of other fields of human endeavor. I think I mentioned this a point earlier on, that Egyptians are known for the world's first civilization. And even up to today, we still look at Egyptians as having some of the best mathematicians, geolog geologists, and any other occupation that you can think of. Now, Egyptian art influenced the art of the Greeks, who defeated them around the 333 before, years before the birth of Christ. So even when the Egyptians were conquered by the Greeks in the year 333 BC, that's 333 before the birth of Christ, they still had some influence of their art by the Egyptians. Now the art was and is still the bedrock of this civilization of Egypt, like we said, and most of our human endeavor surrounds this Thought of Egyptian art. Now, Egyptian Greek or Greek sculptors implemented the strict sculptural conventions used by the Egyptians. Do you remember what we said about their sculptural pieces? That they follow very strict conventions. So, the Greeks, after conquering the Egyptians, still follow this sort of convention. Now, the jewelry production techniques of the Greeks was also influenced by those produced by the Egyptians in the Middle Kingdoms. Now, the designs of the Egyptians in the areas of architecture, sculpture, painting, and especially that of graphics, influenced Islamic arts. So we'll learn why Islamic arts came in. So after the Egyptians were conquered by the Greeks, then the Greeks were also conquered by the Romans, then the Muslims also conquered the Romans. So even if you look at the modern way of Islamic art, there's a lot of influence by Egyptian art. So the writing systems invented by the Egyptians were mainly pictographs, and it has influenced other forms of writing up to today. Now, in in 333 BC, like we said earlier, the Greeks conquered Egypt, 
and introduced what you call the Hellenistic art. Now, the Greeks built the city of Alexandra and also constructed banks, cemeteries, uh, libraries, museums, and other public buildings. And all these art forms that they produced were influenced by the Egyptian art. Now, the Greeks also introduced what we call um, shiny uh, cubes. We call them mosaic, if you've heard of that. So you use shiny cubes to compose images on the floors and ceilings of architectural houses. So these were influenced by Egypt. So when, when these Greeks conquered Egypt, even though they were using their own sort of art, it was still influenced and they influenced each other such that you could find some Egyptian art in Greek art, you could also find some Greek art in Egyptian art, more or less modernizing, changing. Again, the, some other foreign influence by Egyptian art include the languages. So Greek language and gods were introduced to the Egyptians. So the Egyptians' languages began to change. Now, when the Romans conquered the Greeks in 30 BC, they also introduced Christianity to the Egyptians. So thereby changing the way and nature of how Egyptians looked at their art. So in a certain way, Egyptian art was somehow fading, but it still had influences other, other, over other cultures. Now, Christian themes began or became a popular subject in painting, sculpture, and architecture in Egypt. So unlike previously, when Egyptians basically look at art for the dead or art for eternity, gradually it started changing because there were a lot of painting and sculpture and other art forms which reflected Christianity more than art for the dead. Now, the Romans were conquered by the Muslims in AD 641. Then they introduced the Islamic region and then the Arabic language to Egyptians. So, so gradually, the Egyptians also started changing their way of writing because then the Arabic language was also introduced into their system. So gradually, it was also shaping up and changing gradually. Now, they also introduced the use of geographic shapes and signs in art. That was by the Romans and the Arabics. Now, these are some questions that I really want you to look at because it summarizes all that we've discussed for today. So the first question says, why is, why is Egyptian art referred to art for eternity? So look at it very well because you'll be meeting a lot of it. Why is Egyptian art referred to art or referred to as art for eternity? So you should be thinking around, yes, the art was mainly for the dead, where they have to preserve the, the car or the soul, and then art forms were made to preserve the dead. So that's where you should be thinking around. So find time to answer this particular question. Now question two says, discuss religious beliefs influenced, discuss how religious beliefs influenced the various art forms of ancient Egyptians. So here, I want you to look at the various art forms like we discussed. So you look, a, look a, a little at poetry, look a little at painting, look a, look a little at the other forms like architecture and the rest, and then look at the beliefs that surrounded them, and then use it to answer these particular questions. Then the last of all, we have to explain some of these terminologies in Egyptian art. So hieroglyphics, I think by now, you should have a fair idea of what it is. Do you remember the other forms of writing systems by the Egyptians? Yes, we mentioned three. Even though later there was a fourth one that I introduced, which was Coptic, but we mentioned three main systems. Hieroglyphics, erratic, and then demotic. But look at hieroglyphics because that was the most popular writing forms of Egyptians. So look at the pictograms of hieroglyphics and talk around it. Again, mummy, do you remember what we said about mummies? Yes. Yes, we said Egyptians wanted to preserve the bodies of the dead. So they were wrapped in linen and placed in the various tombs. So that's a fair idea of how to answer that question. So look at this very well. So the next one says ka. So ka means soul. If you can remember, what did we say about the soul 
or, or car of the Egyptian, especially the prominent ones. We said they live after they are dead, and then they had to be preserved, and the soul lived on after life. So look at it again. I'll give you a fair idea. Then what was the Sphinx? Sphinx, if you remember, we talked about the Sphinx when we talked about the pyramids. So the Sphinx were the guards for the pyramids. So look out for why they were there. And lastly, pap papyrus paper. We mentioned papyrus paper when it came to painting because the Egyptians also painted on papyrus paper. And again, they did some hieroglyphics or writing on papyrus paper. So look at that. I've also given you a fair idea of what it is. So write these things um, in your books and post them to me if you have the chance. Let's take a look at them. I really want to look at how you are going to answer these questions to get your full marks. So look at them very carefully and keep on reading your books. Now this is just one part of ancient art that we discussed today. That's Egyptian art. There are other forms of ancient art that we'll be looking at. We'll basically look at the Greek art and other art forms all around the world. So, so we meet in that uh, subsequent lessons. Keep on reading. Please be reminded by these ones because it's going to form a basis upon which we are going to build on in other lessons. So till we meet again, this has been Kojo Usu Apia once again, your facilitator for general knowledge in art. It's been a very wonderful lesson. I hope you've learned so much about Egyptian art. In fact, there's more to read about Egyptian art that we couldn't because it's, it has so much detail. And because of the sacred nature of their art, it's somehow dicey to go very deep because you might not basically need everything. But these are the basic things that you need to be able to write your exams and pass. So till I meet you again, have a wonderful day, and I'll meet you once again. Bye-bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.